Another podcast. This is probably my most anticipated, most waited podcast. Today, I'm here with my boy Chris from All Star. Chris, hey everyone. what's up, man? Hey everyone, this is Christian from All Star Construction. A lot of people know me as uh, Chris as well, and uh, I'm pre- I'm very excited to be here just because we've been talking about getting on this show for a very long time. This has been a very long-awaited. Uh, uh, you know, appearance, and uh, I think we've been talking about it for like three years now. Yeah, I mean, obviously, at my previous show, shout out the Tank and G show. Well, we didn't work that out uh, to get him on, and then recently, you know, I've been I feel like DMing him. You down this week? You down this week? <laughs> but my boy's busy. He's a busy man. He just, you know, he he we brought him in. He brought me into his apartment. Wow, amazing downtown Redwood City. He showed me around. Um, so he's a busy man, but, you know, we got him now, and, you know, we're going to have an amazing show. But um, obviously, right now you've uh, evolved to Chris, All-Star Chris, but when I first met you, you know, I gave you the name Poopies. <laughs> what do you think about that, the, the name when you first, re- Poopies, oh, obviously, <laughs> your brother, Pepe's. A lot um, of people don't know about that, but yeah. for, to break it down, uh, it was back in Sequoia High School yeah. when we I was playing soccer, right, and then... Um, I don't know who came up with this. Did, you, you came Poopies. up with this name, yeah. but <laughs> I don't know how <laughs> how it got transformed. But it, it was a resemblance of my brother, and then it kind of uh, got passed on to me because uh, I was just a, a smaller version <laughs> yeah. of my brother. <laughs> That's <laughs> the, what the, we thought. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, in high school, I you know I gave many names to many of the players. Shout out to all of them. Um, but now, like I said, now you've evolved. You've evolved. You're all star, Chris. I, I got that uh, name now. I, yeah. I got that respect. I got. I got to respect. <laughs> yeah, I can't call you boobies anymore. Uh, but you know, to the fellow, to us, the older people, we're still boobies. But talk to me. Introduce yourself. Obviously, people might not know who are you. So introduce yourself. Like what you're all about. What what's your what you're currently doing. For those who don't know me, um, I'm I'm Christian. I'm the owner of All Star Construction Innovations, and I have a couple of their uh, business ventures such as Visionscape Development and a couple other things that I'm doing um, as well uh, that I'll go more into detail towards the end of the podcast. Now, I started here at at Selby Lane Middle School, made my way to Sequoia High School, then went to San Francisco State University. And then eventually, you know, when I was uh, in college, I couldn't really find the job. I was trying to apply for all these tech jobs and I couldn't get any of the jobs. I applied for Google. I applied for Facebook. I applied for a bunch of other jobs, a a lot of corporate jobs. And, you know, I started doing this construction stuff as a side hustle. And then it eventually became a uh, full-time job. I started growing. I started scaling. And, you know, I had to get license. I had to get insurance. I had to get one worker. I got another worker, then another, then another. Then I had business trucks and I had all these other things that came along with it. And uh, that's how I pretty much started getting all these things together. And I started doing construction. Um, As far as my background, you know, I, I used to do construction with my uncle and my family members, but I never really thought it was something that I was going to do in the future. I was looking more into the corporate world. Um, I was thinking about getting a tech job, but at the same time, I was always an entrepreneur by heart. I always did sales jobs. It's Mm -hmm. something that always motivated me. And I always never wanted to settle. You know, I always wanted to do more and more and more. And that's where, you know, I, I fell in love with the construction industry because I started getting uh, all these uh, deals, you know, mm-hmm. I, I, I had when, when I first started the business, I had no car. I had um, my one of my cars had just uh, blown up due to a, a engine failure. And then um, I was pretty much recruiting online and, and walking down the street and knocking on doors, uh, seeing who wanted to do construction and and uh, I started slowly gathering my name. I built up my trust. I built up my professionalism in in the work environment. And I just started connecting pieces together. And I started collecting money. And you know, as a as a young adult, when you see all these ten thousand, fifteen, twenty thousand dollar checks, you're, you you it motivates you to yeah, do more yeah. and more and more. And and that's where I kind of started the the journey of construction. No. Um 
Wow, I mean, that that's amazing. Uh, obviously, proud of you where you've come. Obviously, I've known you since you were a little kid and where you, what you've become. Uh, it's amazing, motivating. Uh, but something I, I learned, you know, I've made my research about you is I guess one of the factors for you to go in this way to be your own owner, your own manager, your own person, you know, is because you didn't want to work for someone, right? You didn't want someone to tell you, you got to do this. I need this by this deadline. So what what brought you that mentality? What, what made you decide, you know, I want to do everything, you know, on my own, on my own time, and I don't want no one telling me what to do. Man, well, you know, <clears throat> I I really got that discipline from, from uh, boxing. Mm -hmm. Boxing taught me a lot of lessons, and it taught me how to maintain a long-term goal. I mean, when you go into the ring with someone, you're, you're literally going face-to-face -face with someone with, uh, uh, hundreds of people watching and, and you're going into the ring and you, you know, you, you have to make sure that you're disciplined because, you know, you, you have a lot of people watching you and you, you have to, uh, kind of, you know, hold it down for your yeah. gym, <laughs> you know, and you don't want to, uh, upset anyone. So that, that was always my, my mentality uh, as far as like, uh, uh, never settling, you know, I, I always wanted to do more. I, every time I, I went in the ring, I, I, I made sure I was 110% extra ready. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and I always prepared for more than what I should. So going back to your question, as far as like the, the, uh, the discipline and, and the, uh, what, what made me not want to work for someone, it's pretty much knowing that I had more in me. I didn't mm. want to just, you know, have a regular nine to five job. I wanted to help people. I wanted to, to, to be the guy that broke the curses, you know, the generational curses. I wanted mm -hmm. to be the guy that, you know, that is able to buy a house for my mom, for my family, mm -hmm. uh, is able, is able to support my community, give right. back to schools, give back to, uh, and it just feels very great when you can do all those things. And a lot of the, the, the people that taught me that were the programs I was in, in, in high school, uh, for example, Summer Search, uh, mm -hmm. Upward Bound, the Electronic Arts Academy, it, it, a lot of people donated to those nonprofit programs, which made me realize how worthy I was of uh, uh, to, to, to make something else more of myself and not just uh, take that for granted. Because, you know, I grew up in, in, in a very bad neighborhood, so... Uh, for to, for for me to to prove to the to the younger adults that I can do it, you can do it too, regardless of your background. It was that was a very important message for me, and that's what really kept me going and and kept me, you know, uh, not settling, not wanting a job. I, I I just knew I had more in me. Um, another thing I heard right, and which leads to your mentality, right, was um, in high school, obviously. I guess, uh, the, how did this happen? So a counselor spoke to you and, and told you, I don't think you'll make it in college. Like, I don't see you taking yeah. that path. And I believe, right, that your mom, you know, obviously didn't want to take that as an answer. So she f went to San Francisco State, talked to someone there, asked them, what can my son do to go to a university or four-year university? But Thank before you get there is... Hearing that from someone, obviously you're at what, 16, 17 years old at that time? Yeah, I was like 16, 17. You hear that from someone, you know, I believe, you know, I think when we were in Sequoia, they were all very helpful, very, you know, people when I was there and they wanted the best for you. But to hear that, like, how did that make you feel? Did you have some self-doubt or did you say, you know what, I'm going to prove this lady wrong or whoever it was? You know, the, what, what's interesting is that my mom, every ever ever since I was a freshman in high school my mom always told me you're gonna go to a four-year you're gonna go to a four-year and and she kind of manifested that vision inside of me she was mm -hmm. and she always kept on saying you're you're gonna go to a four-year uh college uh regardless of whatever comes down your way you're you're gonna go you're gonna do it and these people are gonna help you so um my my mom really pushed me to to really gain that mentality and I just had to execute. I just had to make it happen. And, and a lot of people that helped me, uh, do that were, uh, the program upward bound mm -hmm. Myrna, I mean, uh, Maria and Lena, they really helped me out. And, and all my other classmates that really supported me, helped me get into a four year college because like you said, at the time, um, 
th- there was a a, a a counselor that said, "Hey, you know what? Uh, this is your 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 senior year. Uh, you really have to start looking for other options." And um, and and you know, and and going to a four year is not is not an option right now. And I still even even I, I took the SATs. I didn't do so well. The thing about me is that I was never the best student, but I was never the worst. I was always the one in the middle. I was always a C student. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't because, you know, I, I, I've never I was I was never book smart. Like if you tell me if, if I if I have to read a whole chapter of history. Right. right. And I have to take a test on it. I I kind of overthink things on, on uh, as far as like the question. So. Mm-hmm. So I was never a good test taker, but I was always a hard worker, and that's mm-hmm. what really differentiated me from, uh, from 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 uh, going to college. That that extra uh, push, and and at the time I was also doing uh, boxing, mm-hmm. and I was doing um, uh, 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 programs after school and all that good stuff. So just uh, having a very busy life really uh, impacted my my success in school, mm-hmm. but. Um, all the people that that were really around me were the ones that supported me to get to over that loop. But, um, you know, it, it all comes down to your mentality, how you envision it. I know, uh, Conor McGregor says, you know, if I can see it, I can achieve it. And that, that's sometimes what it takes, you know, that person to give you this vision or yourself to give you that vision and you kind of go for it, you strive for it, you chase it and you make it happen and you make it happen because you make it happen. So until that last day that, you know, all my friends were graduating, mm-hmm. I still didn't have a acceptance letter. I had oh. all rejection letters, rejection from East Bay, rejection from uh, UCLA, rejection from UC Davis. And the only school that was left was uh, San Francisco State. Mm-hmm. So that was the only opportunity that I had and I hadn't heard from them. So um, I remember uh, one of my friends was graduating and her dad uh, came up to me and she was like, and he said, oh, look, my daughter's going to this university. Where are you going? And I, I felt ashamed, man. <laughs> and yeah, I felt yeah, yeah. ashamed. And and uh, and I remember that day because, uh, you know, I, I, I was graduating and I, and I was lost, you know, and then. I, I talked to my mom and, and she was like, you know what, Christian, we're going to go to San Francisco State and we're going to talk to someone and we're going to make it happen. <laughs> so we, <laughs> we drove up to San Francisco State. We had never visited uh, the, the, uh, yeah. the school before. And, and this was literally the last opportunity. So we got there. We went to the uh, counselor's office and we talked to this guy named Justin. I still remember his name, Justin. Uh, Asian guy and we we talked to him and he was like hey Christian uh, and Maria I'm glad you guys came over here there's a lot of students in your situation you guys try very hard and you know you might not be the best student you might not be the worst but I can tell you have a good uh, work ethic because Mm -hmm. you came all the way over here to prove to me that you want a chance to be in this school and that shows me that you're hungry so Sooner or later, um, he was. He said, "I'm gonna, he, I'm gonna uh, let you guys know what I can do with your application." So a couple of days later, I receive a call from Justin, and he was like, "Hey, you know what, Christian? You got accepted to San Francisco State." And I remember uh, I was shocked. I, <laughs> I couldn't believe it because you know this was my last chance. <laughs> And, uh, and if I wouldn't have gotten accepted, I mean, I would have gone to community college or something. It just probably would have took me longer and stuff, right. but, um, that was my mentality. I, I didn't see community college as a, as a backup option. I just wanted to go straight to the four year, um, because that was just what, what my parents had told right. me yeah. and <clears throat> I got accepted and I was super excited. I got accepted through this program called, uh, the educational opportunity program, mm-hmm. EOP, Oh, and, yes, yes, yes. and they I, had a pre-program so if you pass that pre-program then you can get accepted to mm-hmm. to the school and i right. passed a pre-program i got accepted and then um i had a very tough time in in, in college as well yeah the first semester i got um, academic probation i wow. was this close to getting kicked out i got out of it i got back in it i got out of it but um, I always told myself, like, no matter how hard it, it gets, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm still going to come on top. And that's been the story of my, f- my entire yeah. life. I've always been the underdog, and I've always came mm-hmm. up on top. No, I mean, yeah, I agree with that. You know, the underdog, even, you know, back in high school, we played soccer, right? You know, you playing soccer with us, and, you know, back then you were smaller and stuff. 
but you would still score. You know, <laughs> you would still find a way to make it work. And like you said, that's been the story of your life right now. And it's very uh, hearing your story. You know, it's like if I'm honest, I'm the complete opposite of you. I'm more of a I was always smart. I was a great test taker. I didn't have to try hard enough because I w- it was just easy. But what I didn't have that you have was the the drive. The if I were to push myself even harder, man, what could I have been, right? So that's after years. Obviously, you know, as older I got, I started to want to have that mentality. And uh, one of the things that we used to do a lot was the boxing, right? Obviously, you boxed, and when you, you know, I would see you at the gym, and you're like, you want to get like a better workout, you know? I'll teach you. And you know, before I, I didn't know how to throw a punch. I mean, I fought southpaw, even <laughs> though I'm right-handed. And you know, then you taught me, and just now working you out with knock you. someone out, man. Yeah, I, could, I mean, I, I haven't been boxing, but I want to get back into it. But man, those workouts were amazing. And like I said, it's just with life, right? We get different challenges, different things to learn. And it's always the mentality. If you believe that I'm the worst, I suck, I'm not going to achieve it. Well, you're not going to do it. But if you believe, like you said, that, you know, what, whatever it takes, I don't care if I have to not sleep, not eat. I'm going to take care of this fucking shit. And I'm going to get it done. Gonna, and, yeah. and that's the mentality all the greats have, you know, in sports and life. Like, they, they breathe, sleep, whatever they need to get done. And, mm-hmm. you know, sharing that with, with the people, you know, I hope it motivates you, someone, you know, that's younger, to be like, you know, you can do it no matter what. Like, even your parents might even tell you you're not good enough. But you just have to have that mentality to say, you know, I am. And exactly. I will get it achieved. Exactly. And, 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 and that's with, with Napoleon Hill. He had a, mm-hmm. a great book, and, and uh, he interviewed one of the, the, the top 100 uh, most successful people in, 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 in the world. I think it was the top 100. And uh, he, uh, what, what he found out in a lot of people is that they all manifested a belief and they made it happen. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what what uh, what you were talking about. That you know, if you if you can imagine something, envision something, and 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 you really believe it, like deeply, actually believe it, then you can make it happen. So touching on that, so do you do a lot? I know I've seen you uh, in your social media you do a lot of networking. Um, you you've been talking to Tom Brady's dad, right? Uh, stuff like that. Uh, do you like read books? Do you listen to like? audiobooks or stuff of like stuff like that you know what the greats do for you to you know try to get that same mentality you know what the the first uh two years of business when mm-hmm. i first started my business i um i read a lot of books um and before i started my business i kind of started this manifesting stage where i would I, I i read like five books and the two books that really helped me out with which my my mentor Ernie pushed me to mm-hmm. are um think rich think and grow rich mm-hmm. and then uh the other one the uh um the the one by Napoleon Hill I forget yeah, the one you mentioned yeah. yeah so so those two books um I, I'll, I'll I'll put I'll send you the the yeah. thing and maybe you could put it uh-huh. but those two books were the two books that really um got my my mind going and what and what did those books like talk about or what's it, the it, premise it talked about oh the other one was with uh sorry uh Robert Kiyosaki the the Wait, that's the uh, the the think and grow rich, and then the other one is by Napoleon Hill. Mm-hmm. So um, <clears throat> yeah, so I mean, both of those books. One, one talked about uh, like uh, the think and grow rich. Talked about um, pretty much how how uh, how you view money, how you see money. There, mm-hmm. for example, he talks about the four quadrants. There's like the the E quadrant, which is employee. S quadrant, which is the self employed, and the B and the I. And he talks about how. Um, you you want to get you you can start off in in all quadrants and make your way up to a B and an I and which is a business owner and an investor. So um, pretty much he he kind of shapes your mind in, in how you see money and how money works. Um, the other one, Napoleon Hill, just kind of talks more about the manifesting uh, part of it. Mm-hmm. So those pu- those two books really um, kind of uh, helped me. Uh, 
get a little more driven towards my goal and kind of started shaping my mentality um, before I went to business because I knew it was going to be a war. I knew it was going to be tough. The first two years, I think that the first four years, I think it's like 50% of uh, businesses fail or and something like that. Yeah, that and I believe like the first three years, it's no profit, you know. Oh, it's, yeah, yeah. It's just, you know, you're just trying to get by. You're just right? trying to get by, yeah. But then after that is where you, you yeah. see that fruition, the benefits. Exactly. Um, but getting to that, All Star Constructions, where did this come from? Where did you be like, you know what? Uh, well, obviously, we missed a lot. You try to do a lot of things, but where did this, like, drive to do this come from? Yeah, so the drive that uh, All Star Construction came to, so two years before I actually started All Star Construction, me and my business partner, Victor, mm -hmm. were talking about starting a construction business. Mm -hmm. So he was working for a developer, uh, building buildings from the ground all the way up. He built the, the buildings in San Carlos Avenue mm -hmm. uh, and a couple others around the area from the bottom all the way up. And mind you, he didn't know anything about construction. So, um, and 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 we kind of started talking about this because he was working for the developer, and I was kind of doing my own thing on the side, mm -hmm. and I was also doing like a marketing business at the same time. Yeah. Um. And I and I had to choose either the construction business or the marketing business, and I kind of just. I started seeing more money and more profits, more revenue, and and the thing, the the network just started uh, pushing more towards the construction, you know, because I have family members in the field, I have mm -hmm. uh, more connections in the field, so I started pushing more towards the uh, construction side, and I remember, um, like like I said, me and Victor talked about it two years ago, and then when we were slowly starting to pull the trigger on it. Um, you know, I was doing side jobs with my stepdad and then he got, a, uh, at the, at the time he wasn't employed. So we were just kind of doing our little side jobs and then he got a job and then I kind of just went my own way and I, I was, I started getting deals. I was in college and I, I remember I was, uh, it was, uh, pre pandemic. We, I was in, I was in college and I would get out of class to go attend my, my jobs because mm -hmm. I had clients so, um, so I would, I, I would be in class and then I would get a call from a client and I would step out and he, and they would be like, Hey Christian, I, I need you right now. Can you come? And I would literally leave class and I would go to my client's <laughs> house just to see what was going on. Right. So I was kind of trying to manage both. And then it came to a point where I was this close to graduating and I was like, man, I don't know how I'm going to do it. I'm, I'm getting busy with construction and it's going great. You know, I'm getting 10, 20, $30,000 mm -hmm. deals uh, and it's going great, you know, and, and then I have my education on the line. So I was this close to graduating. And then right when when uh, the pandemic happened, the I mean, right when when I uh, yeah, the pandemic happened mm -hmm. and then everything closed. Right. Mm -hmm. I was about to graduate and, I, and everything went virtual. So it gave me that flexibility to to start um, to, to pretty much to do both. Do both. Yeah. yeah, because I was doing Zoom. So, yeah. you know, I would be nailing, nailing, a, a, a ha hammering down a nail, <laughs> right? Yeah, and I would be in, in class, Zoom with yeah. my other headphone. <laughs> <laughs> I would just black yeah. out my screen. Yeah. And, and I ended up passing all my classes. But I don't, if it was for, if it wasn't for the pandemic, I think I probably would have just uh, maybe not finished or something yeah. because I, it was going very well. And, and I kind of saw my, my path in the construction industry. And then at the time I wasn't doing it with a license. So. Um, then me and Victor started getting more busier and, and, um, and then we, we, we went, uh, we went full on, we got the licenses, the insurances and all that good stuff. We started, uh, you know, when you first start a business, you have to figure out the name, you have to figure out the logo, you have to do the LLC right, files, LLC. all that stuff. So we started slowly doing all that and, and just pushed our way towards all with all star construction is. So that's how we kind of mm -hmm. got started and, and, um, and we grew uh, fast, very, very fast. And we grew locally, um, mainly because we were very trustworthy and because uh, we were we were honest with our clients and we did uh, what needed to be done. Even if, like you said, we, we didn't make money, we would still get it done. So break, obviously, right now the business is thriving. So what what is a day to day look for you for your business? So people get an idea of like, you know, what, what do you do? 
So, so a day to day, um, it, it, what, what I do is I focus more on the sales part of the business. So mm-hmm. I focus on business development, mm-hmm. kind of growing my business, expanding, thinking of new, n- new ideas, innovating and, and pretty much figuring out, uh, get, getting partnerships, figuring out how to scale the business. And my business partner, Victor, focuses on the operations. So he focuses more on the management of the construction projects, uh, uh, the protocols, the safety, and, and getting getting the materials out to the workers. And that's how we we both work hand in hand because in in business it's it's good to have both. You know, you you have the sales guy that's that's getting all the revenue, that's getting right. all the money, and then you have the operations guy that's tackling every task day by day. And when you mix both of those people together, you get a a, a, a massive uh, impact. So that's how we kind of work. A day to day for me, you know, I I wake up early in the morning, six a.m. Sometimes five a.m. I used to do the the five a.m. four thirty a.m. Yeah. I kind of got off of it for yeah. a minute, but I'm trying to get back into it. But so, yeah, six a.m. Wake up, go to the coffee shop, uh, start networking with people, drink a gold cappuccino, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, and pretty much uh, start um, start kind of making a game plan for. W- w- how I'm going to tackle my day uh, and uh, and go to meetings, um, either estimates, uh, do um, try to figure out how to get more sales, uh, meet up with clients, kind of uh, do all the problem solving in, in the business and also ma- do a little bit of management. So mm-hmm. uh, but the, the interesting thing is that in business, you don't know how your day is going to be, you know, like someone can literally present to you an opportunity somewhere in San Francisco or something. And next thing you know, you're driving out there um, or maybe even another country, you know, in, 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 in Mexico or, or, yeah. or, or something of that sort. So um, that's a, that's a good thing about business is that you're in full control of your time. Uh, no one really tells you uh, what, what to do. You know, you, you kind of make your own schedule. Uh, for example, if someone were to tell you by tomorrow, uh, hey, you're gonna open up. A, uh, you're gonna open up a, a barber shop, right? Mm-hmm. Let's say you 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 have to start from scratch, right? You have to figure out a, a name. You have to figure out a logo. You have to figure out the hours. You have to figure out how you're gonna market it. You have to figure out um, how how you're gonna price it. And then you start organizing your shop. You start doing this. You start doing that. And then you kind of start figuring out what a routine looks like. And that was the hardest part when we first started business because we 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 were new. We never had a, an official like uh, business. So so you kind of start making your own rules. You know, <laughs> so you make your own prices. You 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 have to do a lot of research. You start establishing hours. You start having to do this LLC form, right. and then you have to figure out your finances. That's a big one. Uh, you have to know your numbers, um, and then and then you start seeing seeing money, and you start figuring out how how to move your money, you know, and how to invest it, and 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 you start seeing what works, what doesn't. So it's a whole, you know, it, it's a whole. Um, uh, journey and and I think that's the greatest part about business is that you don't know where tomorrow's going to take you. And I guess it, that's what makes it exciting, right? It's not like, for example, you know, you go to a nine to five, you know what to expect, what time's your lunch, what time you leave, and then you kind of also leave work once you're home. But I'm guessing for you is work's twenty four hours, right? Yeah, it's yeah. like you can get a call right now. Hey. I saw you, your Instagram, I have this, are Mm -hmm. you interested? And you're like, of course, because it's business. Exactly. So how are you with managing your time? You know, obviously we're all human. We have lives, friends, whatever, uh, family. How do you manage that? How do you balance work and life? You know, the the first uh, two years of business, it Mm -hmm. it was uh, very rough. I missed out on a lot of, uh, you know, when I first started my business, I was only 22 at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, and now I'm 27. So um, I started very young and I had to learn a lot at a very young age. I had to learn how to, you know, um, it, just your emotions, you know, how to mm-hmm. control your emotions, how to uh, react to uh, certain situations, how to, uh, you know, kind of let things go. And, and sometimes you sh- you you can't have control of everything, you know, sometimes you have multiple things going at once and, 
and and there's things that are just out of your control that mm-hmm. are uh, that happen uh, and you can't there's no way of reversing reversing it you know it's like if a family member dies like you can't go back you know you can't you can't reverse that you know you can't avoid that That's and true. there's things that just happen along the way and and uh and and that was uh w- one of the things that 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 uh as a young entrepreneur i was kind of uh dealing with so you know um what, what was the question again so <laughs> i i, I, I just kind of how do you do, do you um find figure out a way to make a balance in your life like oh, okay. work Sorry. Okay. life like i said or are you just all work 24 hours yeah so okay so going back to to your question as far as like a a balance um i like i said uh two, two years ago my life was very unbalanced i would mm-hmm. miss a lot of events a lot of family mm-hmm. events and mm-hmm. my my family thought i was crazy because they never saw me monday through sunday i was working mm-hmm. and um and and i i missed uh easter i would miss um you know holidays birthdays and all. then for context already in Europe, was like your family they always throw great parties. <laughs> There's always a party for everything, you everything. know, and everyone gets together, uh-huh. you know, friends, everyone. So, but yeah, I mean, exactly. it must be tough. You know, the, you have all your family members mm-hmm. and uncles like, hey, where are you? Where are mm-hmm. you? And, and, and then when you show up, you show up very tired. You show up very drained and you're like, yeah. n- no one, no one w- will understand, you know, and you get a lot of criticism, even from your family, you get a lot of criticism, like, man, this guy's always working, like, it's good to work, but don't work too hard, Mm -hmm. and what I had in my mind is that that's what they told me in boxing, they were like, it's good to train, but don't train too hard because of this, right, Mm -hmm. but that's what really takes you apart from the competition, if Mm -hmm. I would have just kind of stuck to boxing, Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, and I would have kept doing it and, and gone 100%, I w- and and not have that that uh, th- that limit. I I I could have been a pro, and that's what always gets to me as a motivation in mm-hmm. business. That you know, like I I was told this all my life, and and now that I'm older, I can see why it didn't work in the past. And and now, in order to make this work, I have to do it like this. You know, um. So so that so as far as like the time management and when for the first two years of business i was super busy not getting any days off working 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 like you said no pay um i i wasn't getting paid for the first two years of business and and it was a very uh it was a very tough time um i i was getting by be, the first year of business because i i was collecting unemployment because of the pandemic right oh, and man. then the second year i was splitting my check with uh with my business partner he was right. working a full-time job and he gave me half of his salary to to get by um and and we just had this vision that we were gonna make it work right mm-hmm. uh, regardless of the circumstances so now as um as a as a four fifth fifth year business owner mm-hmm. i can see things from miles away i can see things from from uh from a distance, right? I, I I know when a good deal is a good deal. I know when a bad deal is a bad deal, and I know when uh, when 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 to use a specific uh, amount of uh, energy towards a goal. Mm-hmm. So uh, as far as the time management, it's still a little tricky, right? Because you have uh, unexpected things that are always coming your way. But now I feel like I have. Uh, how do you call it? I, I call it standing money. Standing money is like where I'm at a job site and I can and I could stand at the job site and I could think, you know, I could be like, OK, this has to go over here. This has to go over there. OK, we're going to do this. Or oh, you know what? I don't like it like that. Change it this way. So so now I have the ability to do that. Back then, I would I would I would be rushing. So I would be like, hey, no, we got to do it like this and we got to do it now. Uh, not taking shortcuts, but just kind of more on a panic mode, you know? Right. Uh, like now it's like you can gather yourself, really process, think about it, be uh, like, uh, you know, have a plan. Exactly. And not worry about like, yo, I need I need this job done because this job is going to pay for the next job. Exactly. Yeah. And it's kind of that, that development field, like kind of like if you look at uh, Cristiano Ronaldo, right? <laughs> you look at how he used to play back then, he would be the speedy guy. He would do these tricks and all that mm-hmm. stuff. And, and now if you see him play, 
he looks he doesn't risk himself too much to not get injured mm -hmm. and he looks for these specific opportunities you know he he mm -hmm. cuts in when he needs to cut in mm -hmm. you know he he looks for 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 those crosses he looks for those goals well yeah i mean his uh his evolved in the game um obviously before when he was younger he was a winger but now he has transitioned to a number nine a striker so less movement more going in the space taking advantages so but it all comes with wisdom getting older and you know he's been playing soccer for what 25 years so now Crazy. you're in this five years you know your way around you know you yeah. know what to do you know like you said the what network. is right what is wrong exactly um you know what needs your full attention and what you can delegate to someone else to take care of exactly exactly that's exactly how it is and also your network like the network of people that you meet uh kind of also teach you valuable lessons and and they they also uh teach you how to how to um look at life i have a friend his name's armando mm -hmm. and he's like christian christian relax why why are you stressed mm -hmm. you got to relax we're, we're enjoying a cup of coffee mm -hmm. this is called fiaka time fiaka <laughs> time it's it's a croatian word it's called fiaka and uh and that means to to kind of live in the present live in the moment relax just enjoy what you're doing forget about everything else right. and and just kind of enjoy your cup of coffee <laughs> yeah i mean i feel like it's not just you everyone doesn't live in the moment sometimes you know we're all thinking about whatever it could be stresses uh bills family relationships and you know like you said enjoying a cup of coffee with a friend having a conversation um and actually being in that moment a lot of people don't do you know they're constantly mm -hmm. worrying about i got to I got to do this coffee thing because I got to pick up my kid or I got to go to work. Like if we all were to live in the moment, enjoy it because tomorrow's not promised. Exactly. Tomorrow is not promised. Tomorrow that friend might not be there anymore. Mm -hmm. that whatever. So just enjoy it, savor it and you know, live in the moment. Exactly. Exactly. And and you start <clears throat> like like uh you, you start appreciating more uh things more when you start realizing that uh and and having this experience in business like the f mm -hmm. first two years that i didn't see my family when i see them it's it's a it's a very joyful feeling mm -hmm. you know because um it, it 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 makes me appreciate uh the the moments with them a little a little more it makes me kind of uh reflect on the times that i wasn't able to be with them and now that i do have this opportunity it kind of blesses you it's kind of like when you have this tragic uh accident or, right. or an injury you uh, you don't you don't really uh think about it but once you actually have the injury or, or you have whatever you have right you you kind of start uh thinking about how grateful you were right. before you had that you know? yeah 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 like um yeah like when you've had an injury right you start thinking, man, I, I remember when I didn't have the injury, I can just walk exactly. or run. So, but yeah, that's good. How does someone like you, have you faced adversity and how have you overcome it? Or how has it affected you? Has it brought you down? Have you ever felt like, obviously right now you have this positive mindset that you can do anything you put your mind to, but have you ever been in a place where you're like, I don't know if I can do this. Like, I don't believe in myself right now. Man, I think since a child, I, I've, I've faced adversity. Mm -hmm. um, just the, the, where I grew up, man, uh, a lot of people, you know, I, I was living with, with, uh, with, with in a bad community with uh, drug abuse, violence, and, and a bunch of other stuff. And, you know, um, a, a lot of the kids that came out from the same area don't really uh, – get the opportunities that 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 uh that i have received and and most of those opportunities i kind of also created them for myself because i saw all those things happen and and uh overcame them so i mean all, all the time man uh, growing up also um it, it, it at the beginning of my freshman year uh my parents were deported to uh to mexico so mm -hmm. I, I had a couple guys, uh, I, it was a, a, a Monday morning and, 
and uh, some guys came out with battens and they were blocking my driveway with black SUV trucks and they started uh, as I was going out of out of school they started screaming at me and my brother where's your dad where's your dad he, I, I know he's inside we need to see him and we were like oh I don't know where he's at I don't know where he's at and uh, they they uh, my mom came out and she started crying and they started like threatening her and they were like, oh, uh, we need to talk to this guy. And they finally came inside my house. They grabbed my dad. They shoved him in a van and they deported him to Mexico. My mom, uh, she was also about to get deported. But uh, since she had my little sister, she was uh, she was able to stay. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, all those challenges helped me really uh, create a, a, a very uh, tough, tough skin, you know, tough, tough uh, mentality because, you uh, as as a young adult you know not a lot of people go through that and yeah and you wouldn't expect those experiences to happen to you either right but you kind of live through it you kind of grow through it and 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 it made me kind of mature a little faster than than the regular uh people right um boxing too man i i had a lot of uh adversity there you know every day i would go in people would uh, you know, the talk smack. It's a yeah. very, uh, it's a very masculine sport. You Alphas, know, it's a yeah. alpha sport. Yeah. So yeah. people are always talking shit to you, man. They're yeah. always <laughs> like, "Oh, I'm gonna beat your ass. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do that." And uh, and you just have to stand your ground. You have to. I remember one time this kid was like, "Oh, I'm gonna beat you up just like I beat your cousin up." And we went in the ring and we went at it. And I had to stand my ground, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's it just uh, a lot of times where. You know, I, I, I've always been the underdog and I've always had to come up on top as well. Boxing, same thing. I was losing a fight. I was I was uh, I, w uh, I was losing two of the rounds and I told myself I'm going to knock this kid out because I'm going to knock him out. I went in there. I went in the ring. I threw two right hands and I knocked him down. They stopped the fight. And after the fight, my coach went up to him and he was like, hey, uh, um, are you OK? And the kid's like, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I'm about to fight next. He, he was concussed. I hit him so hard, he got concussed. Damn. And, and I was losing that fight. Uh, it, it was a, a, by two rounds. Yeah. So I knew the third round, It was a, I had to stop him because they were going to close the fight. So all those little experiences that I faced over over time um, have, have always um, shaped me to become a, a more stronger version of myself. I, uh, e even in business, there's a lot of people that were talking like, oh, you're crazy. Uh, how are you going to start a construction business? You don't yeah. know anything about construction. You're young. You're young. Yeah. That, that was the biggest one. And I still get it all the time. Um, I get the you, you're young part. I mean, I, I am pretty young to, to be uh, a business owner. But at the same time, you see Elon Musk, you see uh, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, all these guys. And I would think there's a stigma like, let's say, a potential person, a buyer, right? They look at you. What does he know? Exactly. You know, I want, I'm gonna go with even though, the you know the guy's a little older, he knows his things, right? Mm -hmm. So for you to have the success you've had, it shows to the quality of work and the determination of proving them, you know, wrong that, you know, I can do it and I can do it the best. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and that that's what I I, I faced a lot. Uh, the first two years of business, or, or first two three years of business, I faced. A lot of adversity f from that, like always, uh, being being the younger guy, mm -hmm. and a lot of people were, would always tell me, "Oh, you could be my son's age. <laughs> oh, you could be my <laughs> my 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 grandson." And I'm like, "Oh my God, this is crazy, man." Yeah. <laughs> and and I get it because a lot of their sons are my age, you know. Right. But it, it's just um, you know once once I started building that credibility like you said I started I had to figure out a way where I can jump on on top of the competition mm -hmm. and the way I was doing it was just by being more professional uh, being more organized and and showing my innovative because even though I had those weaknesses of like oh this guy's young he's young but he has the high technology you know there's yeah. still contractors out there going with pen and pel pencils measuring I, I just did a quote recently here in belmont hills and uh i guess this guy was measuring right and the 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 family told me that he took around 45 minutes to measure i pulled my phone out i scanned the whole room with polycam and i gave him the blueprints in less than five minutes wow yeah so all those little, the, 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 those uh, disadvantages, I would always figure out a way 
to 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 jump ahead and 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 figure out a way where I can uh, I can separate myself from the traditional competition right. and and that's what really made me different. Not not too long ago, I did an estimate here in in uh, actually three days ago, I did an estimate in San Carlos and. Um, the same thing the lady was like oh uh, how long have you been doing it for how do i know you can do it and pulled out my ipad started showing her pictures and started kind of uh showing her pictures of the bathroom that she was envisioning mm -hmm. same thing scanned her her bathroom uh showed her the pictures and and just kind of gave her a breakdown of what the process is what i do hey this is like all we're gonna do all your electrical plumbing mechanical framing insulation drywall etc cetera, etc cetera. and then just late nailed it all down and next thing you know she calls me saying she she wants to give me the job after two other guys had already seen it so um it, you just have to figure out a way where where that adversity you can overcome it and and it takes a little bit of thinking um uh, to create systems and to kind of get a little creative and innovative but uh, at the end of the day if you do a little bit of research a little bit of thinking um it, it, you can you can really uh make a big difference you can make a big change to overcome that adversity so you've um obviously right now amazing with the construction doing that but that wasn't your first thing right you know i i remember you had the youtube you wanted to be, uh, obviously, you said a boxer. And I remember you also were into music, right? Yeah, I was You had your music. studio, I remember, in the shed. Yeah. You had to exactly. build it. It was nice. Um, obviously, I had never since I've known you, you've always, like, been innovating yourself. Like, I want to do this. I want to do that. Where do you think that comes from? Like, are you just, something catches your attention and you're like, you know, I want to do that. And I know I can do it. Yeah, man. Um, I... I I think uh, a lot of that innovative, you know, in, in, in your early early 20s, you kind of don't know what you want to do. Mm -hmm. So I think the best way of figuring out what you want to do is by trying out new things. So I tried out the YouTube uh, channel and I found out that that wasn't my the, the direction that I wanted to go after exploring it and after seeing the data and numbers and, mm -hmm. and just seeing how... Uh, how I had to be this persona to be in this in this uh, field, right? And then I st I did a couple of jobs. Like the thing about me is that I never had one job. I always job hopped. And mm -hmm. some people say it's good. Some people say it's bad. Yeah. You know, I it, in my in my case, it helped me out because I gained a lot of experience from different jobs. So I worked at a pizza restaurant. Um, I did uh, the the I I did YouTube stuff. Okay. I did um, a lot of sales jobs. The mm -hmm. sales jobs really helped me out. And I did uh, a tech job. I was working at a tech job for almost two years. Um, and and a couple other. Uh, I worked at Home Depot. Mm -hmm. I I did a, a like even though I was in the professional tech field. I, I was never afraid to go back down to, to a Home Depot job because I knew my worth and I knew how, that I can easily go up and down. You know, I can mm -hmm. scale up, scale down. And I knew that I also had the ability to to um, to to kind of get influence and, and inspire people. So that's where I, I kind of got my my. Uh, my my experience from from all these jobs and i kind of just put them all in a box and put it together and and i i figured out that the construction stuff was what i wanted to do and now the construction stuff has gave me the flexibility and the opportunity to do more businesses mm -hmm. such as um the home flipping business mm -hmm. such as um uh an other uh the the podcast venture that i'm talking mm -hmm. to you that i was talking yeah. to you about and a couple other ventures that I don't want to disclose yet, mm -hmm. uh, but they, they they have given me the opportunity to jump into those ventures because of the people that I've networked with. So, obviously, big news right now, drop, podcast coming soon. What's your vision for it? I'm sure it's going to be amazing. Um, you know, why a podcast now? What's the benefit of, of having a podcast for yourself right now? So, so the podcast we I basically want to build a podcast. It's 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 gonna be a, a, a podcast about money. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be a podcast about entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and just different people and the different uh, diversity. Um, and 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 I have the network to reach out 
and make a, a, a couple phone calls to get people in in a nice area and get people uh, that are like musicians and, mm -hmm. and uh, actors and and a, a bunch of other diverse networks. So I felt like um, why not do something with that network and, and kind of scale it and and see where it comes up with uh, where it goes from there. So it's more of a, it, it's more and it's also about uh, teaching people um, influencing them and, and kind of teaching them about money as well. So mm -hmm. that's the way it, it's heading to. It's called, uh, I, I won't disclose it, actually. Don't disclose <laughs> it, yeah. But um, once you announce it, you know, I'm going to shout it out to the people that listen to me. Obviously, check out my boy's podcast when this out. It's going to be a banger. I know it. With his, uh, you know, like I said, with your determination. One, one last research that I did, um, I also heard that when you were younger, you actually, I, I don't know where you went, but you went on this trip where they basically said, we're, I don't know, you're with a group, and they're like, all right, survive. <laughs> oh, yeah. Do, do you know what I'm talking about? God. Yeah, that, that was, uh, so, so I went to this, uh, I got enrolled into this program called uh, Summer Search. And not mm -hmm. a lot of people join this program because it's a very competitive program. Mm -hmm. So um, in order to qualify, you really have to go through some hard shit to, to get to that program. Okay. And the reason why is because they put you through some hard shit. So I, I, I pretty, pretty much went through like a 30-day boot camp, right, um, where they took me backpacking for me, that was a boot camp because, <laughs> you know, me as a Latino, I, I don't yeah. call that fun, man. I call yeah. that torture. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they took me to a, to a wilderness trip and and uh, they we went backpacking um, with a couple other students and they told us, hey, you know what? Leave your phones, leave your flashlights, uh, leave everything behind. The only people that are allowed to carry this are your instructors, no one else. So it was a, a group of like uh, 13 people that went on this uh, on this hike. And we were in the wilderness for uh, for 22 days, mm -hmm. and for 22 days, it, it was this experience. From from the first day, we had to get a Sierra Nevada uh, with with by bus. I I I never ha I had <laughs> never been to Sierra Nevada. Imagine they they give you a map and they're like, you have to go to this point right here, and you have to get here by this time, and a bus is gonna pick you up and take you up to the hills. See, I thought you were talking about the beer Sierra Nevada, like. Go oh. get a Sierra Nevada. Oh, you can just go I to wish. the. You can just go to the. <laughs> to the Seven Eleven. The, the they sell them right. So go to Sierra Nevada, the place. The place. And yeah. figure it out. And figure it out. Damn. So so they basically dropped me out, and uh, and I went I went I took a, a train to to another uh, to a bus, and the bus took me up to a hill, and 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 then they dropped me off to a random location. And they were like, "All right, this is it. You guys are the the lucky the lucky twelve, and you guys have to go out in the wilderness for twenty two days, and mm -hmm. you have to show me what you're about." So we picked up these heavy backpacks. At the time, I was only like one hundred fifteen pounds carrying a hundred eighty pound backpack, and uh, and and they had like the bear cans. They had granolas. We had like uh, a pair of boxers, a pair of socks, a pair of shorts some some jeans pajamas and and the sleeping bag and that and and the uh, water and that's all they gave us that's all we yeah. were able to fit in the backpack so went up there we we hiked a lot and every day was a challenge because you had no contact with your family you had no contact with anyone besides those uh those 12 people in your group so you we we were uh we were going out hiking every single day we would sleep wherever we would sleep on on um, on the um, just just on the hills and 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 uh, it was a very tough uh, experience. And uh, if if I would say something changed my life, I would say that program yeah. changed my life. It changed my life entirely, mentally, physically, uh, everything, man. Uh, and and twenty two days to be in the middle of nowhere is is uh, very tough. And and then there was this thing called solo day. We went. Solo day, you you just you were by yourself for three days, uh, with with just a granola bag, and the water, and you had to kind of survive. How old were you when when you did this? I was uh, thirteen years old. Oh snap! Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so I was yeah, I was thirteen in the middle of nowhere, Sierra Nevada, and uh, it really helped me like uh -huh. grow tough skin. It, every yeah. day, I was counting every day, and when you're up there in the hills, yeah. you're just thinking about 
the 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 well, like the stuff you miss here you know yeah, i was yeah. like man as soon as i come back i'm gonna eat in and out <laughs> as soon as i come back i'm gonna get chuck stone that's yeah, you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you start missing all these things and you but you, you come back and you come back really fortunate to have all these things mm -hmm. you know so it's it's like going back to that point where where you don't have something mm -hmm. and and you uh, un until you get it back you f you you appreciate it more yeah and that's exactly what what that uh what that program did and it kind of you know built up a, a, a that was another barrier where you know it kind of built up my mindset it, it, I f every day i felt like giving up you know i was like man this is so tough can i just call someone and go back mm -hmm. but i was just stuck there there was no going back i signed up for it and i had to finish <laughs> kind of you know what david gong says you, know, you gotta stay hard exactly stay hard exactly so um you know we're i think we're, we're coming to the end but I, I got a couple more things um but, but let's get a little bit more you know calm fun so when your business was you know you felt like you know you made it is there one thing you're like man i've always wanted and that you know you bought for yourself um uh, man um well well you know the 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 thing is that um i i think the material stuff doesn't mm -hmm. really uh it, it it does satisfy you but mm -hmm. it satisf satisfies you for a certain amount of time mm. you know you could buy a, a watch you could buy uh, a car mm -hmm. and you start realizing that that hype only lasts mm -hmm. a certain amount mm -hmm. of time so I, I think the the part of business where i felt relieved um i mean there was there's multiple times right mm -hmm. but one of the times was where where i made the transition of like being able to choose my clients being able mm -hmm. to be like you know what i can reject this call because back then I was doing, I'll say like 30 estimates um, in like two weeks. Uh, and that's visiting 30 different people in, right. in the matter of two weeks and getting them out in a matter of two weeks. So the grind was really hard. Um, and, and, and when I was able to finally, because I did those numbers, because I, I put that work in the first two, three years, very, very disciplined work no bullshit everything was just very very driven i i was able to finally be able to choose my clients and be like you know what this client wants to lowball me i don't want him you know you know what this client's a good client i want to keep him and and that was the turning point where i felt like like man like um now i have freedom and mm -hmm. and your quality clients buy you time and that's when i felt like um because like I, I bought I bought two trucks right off the bat. They were brand new trucks, 2022 and zero mileage, and and that that um that gave me some nice a, a nice feeling, but it wasn't the the feeling I got when mm -hmm. when I got when I was able to get my time back. So mm -hmm. I think um, when I was able to finally spend time with my family, finally be like, you know what, I'm gonna reject this estimate on Saturday. I'm gonna reject this estimate on Sunday. That's when I felt like man uh, i i really uh like i i really did it you know mm -hmm. and that was a turning point another turning point was uh was uh like i said i went when i first started the business i was living at my office and i had no shower i had to shower at the gym mm -hmm. and um and, and and it was like a very uh uh it, it like my my room was very tiny i would hit my myself in the in the <laughs> ceiling because i couldn't get in uh, my back would always hurt I, I would never get a good sleep um there was times where i would have to sleep on the first couple uh, of weeks i didn't have a bed so i would sleep on the plywood i would sleep on the floor uh with just a blanket and I didn't tell anyone this because, you know, I was, I, I sucked it up and I didn't want to cry to anyone. I didn't, I just kept it within myself and I was like, you know what, it's only temporary. It's going to, it's going to get better, you know, and I could have easily stayed um, and lived at my parents' house. But I, I said, you know what, I want to, if I'm going to do it, I want to, I want to get the full experience. You know, I want to do it and I want to say, you know what, I overcame this and I deserve this. So that was another turning point, you know, when I was finally able to to get my 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 own place, and I was and and when I first moved into my my place, I was like, 
I you appreciate things more, you know, because and and at first when you when you get something that you think is out of reach, it, it kind of it's this awkward feeling that you can't believe you got it, but you you got it, you know, and and you don't know how to how to react, right? So, um, that was a, another turning point of of of, of my We're trying this again. Um, <laughs> I think we did what like twenty minutes. We just talked boxing. But I forgot to press record. So recorded our voice, but we're going to redo this. So anyways, boxing, right? Big thing, big, big, big uh, part of you. You you did the sport, everything. So what what is your mindset currently right now with the current state of boxing? Um, there's, you know, Canelo. He doesn't want to fight Benavides. Um, and right now, like I said, uh, like I said previously, I really got into the UFC because they give you the fights you want to see. But what are your thoughts on the current state of boxing? Man, I think uh, boxing has been a sport that is uh, very traditional. So in order to kind of make, uh, to, to change the sport of boxing, it, it takes a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. And we've seen it with uh, with uh, the zone. They've they tried to change the game. We've seen it with uh, Jake Paul mm -hmm. as well. He's he's invested in the sport of boxing. Yeah. And he's making all these epic fights happen. and. And fights that we never expected to see. So I think that there's definitely been uh, some evolution in boxing from the the nine, 90s and and way way be before then and and uh, 1900s. I don't know how far the sport goes, but I know it's one of the the longest living sports uh, right. there is in history. So um, it, it's really evolved to to what it has become now. But I have seen a lot of. Uh, what they call ducking, you know, involved in, and like I said, I'm a big Canelo fan, but I think that um, that th there's there's been a lot of politics e even before Canelo, like yeah, Mayweather, Mayweather and mm -hmm. all these other fighters. I feel like you know when like back then it was easier to make the fights, and I get it. There's a lot of money running. There's a lot of uh, hierarchy and there's a lot of people that deserve to do what they were uh, to be at the position that they're at and deserve to pick fights um but i think uh back then it was just more easier to make these fights happen you know yeah. like like the uh classic fights you know you you would have uh the the marcus and and pacquiao fights you would marcus have de la Hoya uh, vargas uh Tr trinidad uh de la Hoya. all these fights happen yeah. And uh, sure, there was a little bit of negotiation, but I think it was more of the the pridefulness. Like yeah. you, you, you did the fight because of your your bloodline, because of your culture, because of your of your flag, and right. and you 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 had to hold it down, and you had to make these fights happen. And I feel another thing in boxing right now is that everyone wants to keep the zero. Oh you yeah. You know the thirty and zero. The undefeated record. And back then, like you said, people weren't afraid to lose a fight. You know, we're talking old school days, like. Muhammad Ali lost, but he would fight, you know, he fought Joe Frazier, he fought um, all the greats, right? And they would fight each other, you know. Mm -hmm. One would beat the other, and the other one would beat, you know, the other. So it was always that constant competition. And like you said, the pride of, like, I want to fight the best. Mm -hmm. Now is all marketing, you know, as everything. Now is my brand. What did Mayweather? What was Mayweather's brand? Obviously money, but no one can beat me. I'm 50 and 0, 49 and 0. Mm -hmm. People try, but they can't figure me out. That's why we watched. You know, I watched because I can't wait to see them lose. Exactly. That's that's why I was watching. And that's what boxing, you know, it's a business. It's marketing. It's, you know, they want to sell the fight. Yeah. And, you know, Canelo, he has to do what's smart for him. But as we were talking about this earlier, I think for his legacy, he needs the Benavides fight to mm -hmm. solidify him. As I was mentioning before, Canelo, he doesn't honestly have to do anything anymore. He's one of the greatest in my generation. The fact that he still trains, you know, when he doesn't have to, he's made so much money, but he still grinds like he has nothing is what, you know, we're all Canelo fans. Exactly. I'm a big, I'm a huge Canelo fan. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, he, I, he was one of the reasons I started boxing. Mm -hmm. I would watch his fights when I was a kid, and, and this guy, I remember Golden Boy would always promote him, and he was... He was a he was a, a good fighter and and like you said to be training since you were like 15 as a pro in Mexico all the way to to your career now um, he has over like 40 something fights and and he's uh, uh he's lost only a few fights 
um, and the ones that he has lost has has have been uh, with great fighters. The, the he only lost twice, right? Bivol. Mayweather and Bivol. And then he has a draw with uh, Triple G. And Triple G, yeah. yes. And some say, you know, he probably lost one of them. But yeah. Um, but uh, one thing we mentioned earlier that that we we're talking about was, even though he lost against Bivol, um, you know, he went up and went. He tried to strive for greatness, but he still unified the 168, you know, exactly. division. Um, and he has, like I said, to us, he has nothing to prove, but to go on top beating Benavides, who I think, you know, is probably in his next great opponent. Yeah. Something we would want to see. And that's why, you know, with the UFC right now is, man, you know, they give you the fights, the best going against the best, yeah. no ducking. Dana White doesn't F around. Dana yeah, White is a savage, man. That guy, he's a, he's a straight up. He he's an OG man, Dana yeah. White. You gotta respect that guy. He makes the fights happen, and he he's just evolved the MMA sport to a, to the UFC sport to a whole another level. Like I remember uh, watching uh, the UFC uh, before they even wore gloves. I, mm. I was watching that as a kid. <laughs> yeah, they would wear shoes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the old ones. Um, but I think Dana White saw an opportunity during the pandemic. There was nothing, no sports, oh, no TV. Yeah. And he said, you know what, I'm going to keep the show going because people are going to want to watch something. You yeah. Know? They're at home. Everyone was bored. And uh, I didn't know anything about the UFC, honestly. I only knew what it was May uh, not May well, McGregor. Obviously, I knew who he was um, back in the day, like Chuck Liddell, Chuck um, Liddell Tito oh. Ortiz, yeah. um, Nate Anderson Diaz. Silva, Nate Diaz. But... 2020, obviously, friend of the show, the rat, Tony, he would always have us over for the UFC. And like I said, in COVID, there's nothing else to do. And out of it, you know, now, you know, I, I enjoy the UFC more than boxing. Yeah. And, and you know what? UFC is a sport that has uh, uh, diversified a lot. Like mm -hmm. they're they're going to Mexico City now, yep. And they're they they're starting a little fan base in Mexico. It's starting to be a thing over there. Brazil, obviously, huge sport in Brazil. Huge. And sport. and they have a bunch of other other uh, countries that they've targeted in New Zealand. Exactly. Like that. Like, and they have great fighters in 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 all countries. You know. Yeah. And and that the the thing about the UFC that gets me interested is that I don't think there's been a fighter kind of like a Mayweather where they've kept their zero for a long time, right? Um, for well, example... It's just John, uh, John Jones. John Jones. Mm -hmm. He had a lot of allegations. Um, mm -hmm. So And Khabib. Yeah. The, the only thing about Khabib is that what everyone says, you know, if Khabib would have uh, fought longer, he, he could have established his career a little mm -hmm. more clear. Yeah. Because uh, he, he had a, a couple of fights where, you know, I think he fought... Uh, Poirier and Poirier rocked him. I think with with the with the with the shot, and and his knees kind of buckled. And no, no, uh, yeah, I think it was like that. And then he almost got him on a chokehold, and he mm. almost choked him out, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, but then you know he choked out Poirier. Yeah, um, but it's like Mayweather too. I mean, um, he was fifty and no, but like those last couple ones, I guess uh, the Maidana ones and. The Maidana ones were that, the first that, one was close. Yeah, that was a close one. Close that was, one. I, I thought Maidana one. But I thought so too. Yeah. But um, when you rewatch those fights, you see what Mayweather's doing. And you see, because when you watch him in the moment, you're in the moment. You're obviously, Maidana, he grew on us. He had, um, what's his name, his trainer, the Mexican trainer. The, Ryan, uh, Robert you know, Garcia. Robert Garcia. Uh, yeah. You're rooting, you know, you're rooting for Maidana. He has that, you know, he fights like a Mexican and you're rooting for him, but when you rewatch the fight, you know Mayweather's in control. Yeah. And um, you start seeing the technicality. You start seeing of it. what, what, and he, that's you know, what, what he's doing. And that's what a lot doing. of people yeah. don't see in boxing. Like, um, there's this fighter, his name is Guillermo Rigendao, mm -hmm. and he he's known to be like a very boring fighter because all he does is jab and he moves away, kind of like a Mayweather style, but a little more over exaggerated. Mm -hmm. And uh, this guy, he's a Cuban fighter, very disciplined. And if you look into the movements and the techniques and all that, you start seeing uh, how skilled you have to be to get rid of those punches. You know, you yeah. could do a lot of offense, but if you don't have defense, then you're you're. And the point, screwed. you know, right, is to not get hit. And Mayweather was the best of that. Exactly. I think what 
maybe like Sugar Shane Mosley is the one that hit him hard. Oh, yeah, yeah. Him, and then earlier, I believe, right? And that's what kind of gets you in that, like, wanting to watch May- uh, Mayweather because yeah. everyone's like, oh, I want to see this guy lose. I yeah. want to see this guy <laughs> lose. I remember we would, every time he would fight, like, a Mexican fighter, yeah. all my family would gather around and, and we would... Uh, we would be like, nah, this guy's going to beat him. Canelo's going to beat him. Well, what was the guy? He he was fighting him good, but then he made the mistake. Uh, Victor Ortiz. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Victor he Ortiz, the headbutt. Yeah. And I remember then, we all were watching that fight. Yeah. This guy just headbutts him and and all hell broke loose. But before Canelo, I remember you were a big Pacquiao fan too, right? Oh, yeah. I was a big Pacquiao fan. Yeah. Pacquiao, this guy... Dude, his his uh, his footwork, his speed, his his work. I think every boxer's work ethic is yeah. unmatchable, man. E- even even MMA, man. Yeah. Um, I mean, all these professional athletes. You know, like you you look at the level of, of training that they do, and it's. I mean, you're getting ready for a war. You know, you're getting ready to go in there and and take punches and and let me tell you those punches after a fight you start feeling the you start feeling the swollen mm-hmm. like you don't feel it during the fight but after the fight you start feeling your head hurt you start feeling your migraines the punch, y- your eyes start getting swollen and and they might be like little little scubs little little nicks and mm-hmm. stuff they add up and you start kind of um, feeling them after the fight yeah, like death and, by and a thousand th- they sword, hurt yeah. man <laughs> they hurt <laughs> No, yeah, I mean, obviously you can uh, sp- speak on it. Obviously, something that on our first attempt, you were talking about how obviously we all grew up soccer, right? Playing soccer, but when, you know, you were always interested in boxing and you said that um, it was kind of a blessing in disguise when, you know, they cut you from the soccer team because then you could put your focus on boxing. Exactly. Um, I was kind of saying, yeah, that I, w- I was... Um you know, I, I was in this 50-50 thing where, you know, I was playing soccer and I was trying out for school and then I was doing boxing and and I kind of manifested myself out of uh, soccer mm-hmm. <laughs> because I was kind of guided more towards boxing. So I got cut from the uh, soccer team and I just, I said, you know what, that's a sign. I, 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 boxing is my sport. And since a kid, I was kind of just tailored to play soccer because of my family, because of my yeah. parents. But it wasn't really something that I really liked uh, to do. You know, I was, I wanted, I always watched boxing. I watched the De La Hoya fights. I watched the, uh, the De La Hoya Vargas and, mm-hmm. and all the uh, uh, Eric Morales, all the, all the, terrible, yeah, yeah, all the classic Barrera. fights. Barrera, yeah, mm-hmm. all the classic fights. And I would always watch them and, and uh, we would always gather around, watch mm-hmm. the fights and, and uh, it was a sport that really uh, excited me. So I was like, you know what? I want to try something else. I want to do boxing. And that's what kind of pushed me towards the direction of boxing. And, you know, boxing, but like you mentioned earlier, this is a sport. You have to be very disciplined. You have to be meticulous. And it's not just, you know, how hard you can throw a punch. It's you have to be, like, quick and you have to read your opponent. Because your opponent is trying to do the same thing. Exactly. It's not just, I'm going to just throw this punch and hope it lands. Yeah, and what people don't know is that sometimes it's just a split of a second that yeah. you you literally, like, move away from a punch. <laughs> you have to time it perfectly yeah. to move away and counter back. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a sweet sport of boxing. It's yeah, a science. Sweet science. Yeah, exactly. Um, and we were mentioning, too, when, like I said, you, like I said, you, you started training me. And like I said... You started showing me how to throw a punch, how to use my my hips, my legs, where to position myself. And I was telling you when we were doing the mitt work, um, how tiring it was just to even keep my hands up because oh, yeah. it would burn my shoulders, my biceps. And but it's one of the best workouts uh, you can ever do. And that gets you. That's tired. Yeah. That when you do. A, when I was telling you, I had to cut the ring to punch you because you had the suit and you're like, all right, cut the ring. And I have the power, but just timing so I would hit you, like, it was so tiring. Oh, yeah, yeah. And and let me tell you, you picked it up pretty fast compared to, like, other people. Like, the like for your first time boxing, you picked it up pretty fast. I, I think you were watching videos beforehand, right? Yeah, so I was just watching. At first, I just did it um, just to work out, you know, because mm-hmm. at that 24 in San Carlos, they had a bag. And, you know, oh, I was yeah. like, yeah, I'm just going to do extra cardio after, like, so I would do cardio, weights, sauna. No, cardio, weights, boxing, sauna. Mm-hmm. 
And then you're like, hey, you know, I'll show you a little bit. Yeah. And you, like I was saying, I, I would throw, I would fight southpaw because I thought my oh, my, yeah, my jab right. has to be my strong hand because it felt natural. Uh -huh. um, but then you're like, no, how about uh, make your your left hand your jab because this is where your power is. Uh -huh. And then, boom, when you taught me how to use my hips to, like, you know, all my energy go in here and the bag would just go, woof. Yeah, you know, and, and that's the thing. Mates. That's the thing about boxing is that you you learn it one time. It's a mm -hmm. like a one time investment. You pretty much put it together one time. You you memorize the punches. You memorize the stands. You, your your jabs. Your right hands. And then once you learn it, it's it's something that stays with you for a very long time. Right. And, and same thing with like uh, MMA and and yeah. uh, jiu jitsu and all that. I I haven't tried. Uh, in jiu jitsu but it's something that i would want to yeah. do in the future um but but uh but yeah like any any combat sport it teaches you a lot it teaches you a lot of discipline and you never know when you might need it yeah yeah um the one thing we also mentioned was uh, even though you weren't really like, obviously you did enjoy soccer but we were saying uh during the christmas games that we play you know it's a dangerous combo to have both of us on top because oh, uh, we saw what happened last Christmas. Um, yeah, that was a very dangerous, dangerous combo. combo. You don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> it's a combination, like I said. Uh, I don't even have to say anything. I put it right there and you'll be there. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> we we have that. Uh, you know when, when you have the, the two blue cards in, 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 in FIFA? <laughs> and ultimate team. And ultimate team. Yeah. That's exactly Perfect what link, yeah. Yeah, it perfectly matched. You had like 99% passing, 99% yeah. <laughs> shot. <laughs> everything we had the perfect combo so uh, i mean e even even the goalie like that guy did not expect any of the i remember when when uh, i i i received a pass and i headed it went right over uh tiny ravelli you know oh, the, uh, ravelli, yeah, 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 yeah that guy like went, i said he, he was a coladera uh, he his reaction time isn't there anymore nah man we just kind of chipped it over him and and he he was like he couldn't even see it. He was diving the wrong way. I think a couple pieces of his hair fell oh. off. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he, I think he dove and he just, his back hurt because he ba couldn't. Yeah. No, I'm there. I'm in my tunnel, but I really much love. Um, you're not good at poker either. But, uh. <laughs> yeah, poker, man. You, you just stay away from that as well. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's a uh, retirement time. <laughs> but, um, you know, we come up now, you know, like I said, uh, we had a little miscue, but we come to the end of the episode. Um, I learned a lot um, hearing your story. Like I said, uh, it's motivating. It's motivating because, like I said, I've seen you when you were a kid, and now what you've become, the, you know, what your business has become, how motivated you are, how you take no for an answer. I appreciate you sharing the story. It motivates me even more to continue this um, because, you know, I don't know, like you said, if you put your head down, focus on it, who knows where this can go. So I appreciate your time. Anything you want to say, you know, about your business, if someone wants to reach out? Um, yeah, so if, if you guys want to reach out, you guys can follow All Star Innovates on Instagram. You guys can follow me at All Star Chris. And you can follow Visionscape Development on Instagram. And, and those are some of the businesses that I'm running right now. I have a couple more, but... Uh, they I, I, they're still not set up but um, stay tuned yeah stay tuned stay tuned <laughs> we'll, we'll get those to you soon and obviously like this video uh subscribe share it with people um make sure you know to follow my boy make sure you know if you're thinking of home reven renovations anything give him a call he'll take care of you um but thank you guys again for always tuning in showing the support um i know this one's gonna be a banger so Stay, you know, I can't wait to show it. And, you know, I hope you enjoyed it. But we're signing out now. Yeah, for thank real. you guys for watching. This is a, the, the, the banger right here the banger, this is <laughs> that my, we've been waiting for for a my, very long my, time. My Cat Williams episode. Exactly. Huh? This is going to be shared all over. <laughs> all right, you guys. Thank you. Peace all out. Right, see you guys.